we'll share my screen again. Can you guys just give me a thumbs up that you can see the presentation? Beautiful. So again, um, just by way of introduction, um, my name is um, James Simcock. I'm one of the surgeons at South Paws Specialty Surgery for Animals in Victoria, Australia. Um, and I'm one of the founders of Vet Dojo. And so we're gonna go through this session. It'll take about an hour today. Um, I've got a bunch of stuff to talk about and I'm not sure exactly how long it's gonna take, but it, it really doesn't matter. If we don't get to some things this week, we'll, we'll come back and visit it in the, in the coming weeks. So the first part of this talk um, is really gonna be just an opportunity to get some kind of feedback, some Q and A going. <clears throat> um, we're gonna talk about a couple of cases I saw this last week. Um, looking at a total hip replacement and a dog that came in with a short radius. Um, and then we're going to go through some just general surgery tips and tricks. So um, hopefully there'll be some interesting content for you guys in there. As we go through, I've got you guys all on mute, but if you do want to ask a question, I definitely do encourage you to do that. Um, I'll go ahead and open up the chat box as well. Uh, if I can find that. Up here. Just give me one second. So I've just got the chat box open as well. So if you guys have any questions, um, you can also just put them in the chat uh, box. And if you, when you're looking at the chat box, you can select either the option to send the messages to everyone or to send them to me personally. I encourage you just to send them to everyone so everyone can see the question that you've asked. And um, as we go through the lecture, I'll um, try to address those as we go through. So we'll get started. So the couple of interesting cases this week. Um, this first dog is a young dog, um, little small breed cavoodle. Um, and this dog came in with a left front leg lameness. And I've kind of given it away a little bit, but I want you to take a look at these x-rays. Um, and then if someone can maybe just give me a brief synopsis of what they think is the, the problem with this dog. Anyone, any takers? Come on, Yui. Surely if I saw it for a three check, that's cheating. <laughs> I don't know that anyone else is gonna jump in here. So do you maybe just let the guys know what we can see? Obviously, there's some uh, shortening of the radius there, causing some pretty major incongruity of the elbow joint. Yeah, exactly. So the big problem with this dog is the um, incongruence that we've got in the elbow. And I'm going to um, just bring up my pencil and just draw some things on here. So what we're looking at is this area just here um, in the left elbow. And we can see that there's a really big step between the radial head and the humeral condyle here. And not only that, but if we look at this lateral view, we can see that there's a gap between the radial head and the humeral condyle, but also the humerus is not very congruent with the ulna. So we can see the ulna notch here. And so this radius being so short has um, really resulted in a lot of changes in this elbow joint. Um, and this is a, a relatively um, common presentation. Um, this has resulted because we've had um, problems with the growth plates distally. And I put the left and right leg on here just to, as a point of comparison. So we can see here on the left leg, the radius and the ulna, the growth plate, it's closed. Whereas on the um, contralateral limb, we can still see those, the radial physis and the ulna physis there. This dog's probably not got a lot more growth to go, but you can see that there's definitely a difference between the left and the right side. And so this dog, um, it was an unknown trauma or problem that created the issue with the growth plate development. The net result though, is that the radius has ended up too short. And these cases are a real challenge. Um, whenever we deal with these angular limb cases, I think the most important thing to remember is that we want to try and save the elbow because most of the time, even if we have a traditional radius curvus where we have premature closure of the ulnar growth plate, the um, external rotation and uh, carpal valgus, most of the time the pain actually comes from the elbow and not the carpus and, and the pain comes from incongruence. And this is, a kind of an extreme example of it, um, but something that is interesting and, and does create a couple of challenges and a couple of questions about how we might actually want to go ahead and fix that. And so with this particular patient, um, the gap that we measured here, I actually did a CT scan on this dog as well, um, but the gap that we measured here um, from the radial head, actually not to the humeral condyle, but actually up to the um, medial coronoid process is about eight millimetres. So I knew that I either had to make the radius eight millimeters longer 
or we have to make the ulna eight millimeters shorter to basically bring this elbow joint back into congruence. And there's different ways of thinking about this. Different people have different approaches and I've treated these in a whole bunch of different ways. So again, I'm going to throw it over to the um, crowd participation um, just to get some insight or some opinions on um, how we might actually try and address this by either making the radius longer um, or making the ulna shorter. So what do you guys think? I'm just going to get rid of the annotations and just pull the chat section up. So Brandon's saying he's going to make the ulna shorter. Um, Lynn is saying it'd be easier to shorten the ulna. Um, Josh Rich sliding cut of the radius. Um, and then I would assume some kind of fixation on there. So I think that those are all um, valid options for sure. And in my experience with these, I've managed them a whole bunch of different ways. My initial thought and my initial tendency and my general approach with surgery is try and keep things as straightforward and simple as I can. And in general, um, I think the most straightforward approach is to try and shorten the ulna. So we generally make an ostectomy of the appropriate amount. Um, and then what we can do is put generally a pin either side of the ostectomy. So I'll just mark this up again so it makes a bit more sense. So if we removed an eight millimeter section of the ulna here, then we could take a, um, a pin and place it across here and across here. And then what we can actually do is take a, um, a towel clamp or a bone clamp and actually apply traction on either side and actually pull that ulna together. And then once we've done that, we can put a plate over the whole thing with some screws to hold everything back in place. And that can work okay. It's actually much easier said than done to do that. And when we're actually trying to reduce that ostectomy that we've created, it can be quite challenging. Um, and so if I had a smaller gap where, you know, the gap was maybe only a couple of millimetres, and I think that that would work well. The other challenge with this dog is that his ulna um, was not very large. And so I was worried about my ability to actually get screws that were going to be meaningful in this distal section of the ulna. You can see it's all just kind of cortical bone there. And so my approach with this, with this case, because we had to grow it so far, um, was to actually try and make the radius longer. And so the next images I'm going to show you um, kind of detail just a bit more about what the problem was in this particular case. Um, but here we have the actual surgery that we went ahead and did. And so um, what we can see here is, again, I'm just going to get my pencil up here. We've made a cut in the radius here. And then with using um, fluoroscope, we actually just made a single cut. And then what I've done is an acute distraction of the radial head. Um, so I've put an external frame on this dog. We're using um, circular fixation and we've got one, two rings distally um, with two um, olive wires through each, um, uh, two olive wires through the radius. And then we've got our connecting bars, which are these threaded rods on either side. And then what I've done is use the connecting rods, which are um, able to be, they've got nuts on there and they've got a threaded pattern. We're actually able to grow that radius. And we've grown that radius using the fluoroscope um, to actually try and get that radial head to be in a nice position with the humeral condyles. So you can actually see with the pressure that I've been pushing up this way, here, we can see that we've actually created a bit of a bend in these pins as we've actually been stretching the radius back out that way. And so um, with this correction, we addressed that um, last week and we we're growing that out. Um, we've got this dog coming back in for a check tomorrow um, for me to reassess and um, make sure that we're still happy with that alignment to allow the tissues a chance to kind of stretch out um, and then to basically um, see if we need to move things a little bit further. So I'm just going to get rid of these annotations again. And so, oops. So um, we've, we've stretched that out over um, just an acute period. So it was just while we're in surgery and we're going to reassess that um, and make sure that we don't need to, to move things any further. As we can see, as I was getting to the limits of that, um, kind of range of moment or movement. I, I was actually in surgery measuring the gap here with a ruler and it was coming out pretty much on eight millimeters. So that's what I planned for. 
And then on the CT, oh, sorry, on the fluoroscope, we could see that this joint congruence with the radius is actually much, much improved. And if I go back now to the um, before and after, we can see the location of the radial head here in this huge gap between the radial head and the humeral condyle. After we've actually stretched that out, we can see that that articulation is in a much better situation and it's, um, it's much, much um, better contact between the radial head and the humeral condyle. And I just wanted to go back one step to this picture here. When we've grown this um, radius by eight millimetres in, um, in one go, what we've done is we've actually put a um, cancellous bone graft into that um, osteotomy or osteotomy space because if we were to just grow that eight millimetres and not do anything at all, I'd be really worried that we'd have a problem with healing there. And so eight millimetres, I'm happy, and I've, I've done similar things before with similar gaps um, where we've provided some kind of fixation and put a, a cancellous bone graft um, in there to encourage bone healing. Um, and obviously I'm, I'm quite optimistic that with that bone graft in there, we'll be able to have a bony union um, that occurs. The other way that we can do this is with a process called distraction osteogenesis, which is where we actually grow um, the bone over a period of time. And we actually, um, day by day, make incremental turns on our threaded uh, connecting bars and actually move that radius just bit by bit over a period of time. But with this particular case um, and that amount of distance that we had to move, um, I decided that eight millimetres is going to be okay. So there's a question there from Mitzi. Um, what's the size defect max you can use for cancellous bone graft? Um, I don't know that there's an absolute number for that. Um, I've definitely, you know, done it for, for dogs that have had eight millimetres. Depends on the size of the dog and, and the age of the dog and the biology and all those kind of things. Um, but I've definitely done that for, for dogs where we've had um, typically um, situations where we've had uh, small dogs um, with a radius on a fracture and then we've had um, bone resorption because of stress protection um, and non-healing and I've had gaps that have, have easily been that big or maybe a little bit bigger that we filled with um, cancellous bone graft. So um, it does work quite well. Um, you do need to monitor them carefully though and be prepared with the owners that you know if something does happen and, and they don't heal up as you'd like that we might need to revisit that um, and potentially do another bone graft in the future. But on balance, these are tricky cases. Um, we have the option of an acute correction, um, which addresses the problem in one go, versus the process of distraction osteogenesis, which is much more involved. Um, however, the distraction osteogenesis, where we're growing the bone over a period of time, requires a lot of um, involvement from the owners, and, and these owners weren't um, wanting to do that. So we made the decision to do the um, acute correction in one go. Um, so there's a question there. What if we had a non-union despite cancellous bone graft? How would you treat that, please? Um, yeah, I'd be doing another graft. Um, and I would expect that we'd have some healing here with the cancellous bone graft. I don't think we'd have a complete failure. Um, but certainly another bone graft would definitely be the way to go um, to um, get that to function. Um, from Mitzi, how much pain is the elbow in immediately post-op? Um, actually, not too bad. So this dog was, when he went home, non-weight bearing, but it's not unexpected. We've, we've done a lot to that leg. Um, Ewan had him in for, one of our interns had him in for a recheck um, this week and I'm pretty sure he's scheduled to come back in tomorrow to see me for another check, um, but we'll just monitor that closely. So when we are stretching things that much, there can be a bit of discomfort there, but that generally will settle down pretty quickly. Yeah, James, I just had with that dog the one week I saw it on the weekend, we've seen it a few times because the dog is weight bearing so well that it keeps destroying its bandage. So it's obviously a lot more comfortable on that. Like, that's great. That's, um, that's excellent. And yeah, it's, it's amazing with these guys, how much difference that can make. This dog was almost non-weight bearing before the surgery um, because of discomfort. Um, and certainly when we're stretching that bone out to um, get that radial head back in a normal location, we're really putting a lot of pressure on those screws. So um, it's amazing that they can be so comfortable. But again, I'm pretty much continually amazed by our patients and, and what, um, what they will tolerate. So yeah, these cases are kind of interesting. There's a lot of hardware on here um, and, and kind of interesting. So if anyone has any more questions on that dog with short radius, anything around that? Just give people a couple of minutes. Just yeah, jot your questions down in the chat section and we can have a look at those. So there's often a couple of minute delay. I'll just give it a couple more moments. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next case. So... This next dog is a 10 month old, 50 kilogram mixed breed dog. Um, so there's just a question from Alan. Um, can we use an iron pin in the radius in the meantime? 
generally it's a difficult joint to get or difficult bone, I should say, to get a, um, an IM pin in. And the reason for that is if I look at a lateral view of the radius, we've got an articular surface at the bottom, we've got an articular surface at the top. And so in order to get an IM pin along the radius, we would either have to penetrate through the distal radial um, articular cartilage or would have to penetrate through the radial head through the articular cartilage. The alternative would be to try and do this in a dowel pin kind of fashion where we actually make an osteotomy and we um, introduce the pin um, from the osteotomy site and then we try and get the two ends together. Uh, but that's not really something that we do very often. Um, I've never done that. And I think that there's certainly better options for trying to provide stability to the radius and an iron pin. So it's not something that I would do. It's out there, it's been described, um, but it's not something that's done commonly. And I think there's a lot of technical challenges with that. Um, so another question, how can we decide whether to shorten the ulna or lengthen the radius? <clears throat> Again, I don't think there's really any hard and fast rules around that. Um, I think that both are options. Um, and I think you need to consider what equipment and skill set you have um, when you're considering either of these approaches. Um, you know, there's a bunch of different um, technical aspects when we're using external fixators. If you're going to use a plate, then, you know, arguably you might have more comfort with those kind of things. But it really, the decision making, there's, it's, there's not one clear path. And I'm sure that if you gave this particular case to a whole bunch of other um, surgeons that they would have different opinions on exactly how you would, would get this done. So um, this is the way that I've used before and I find it works well for me. I'm very comfortable with using the external frames with the rings. Um, I actually really, really love um, these, these frames. This is a little dog and these are um, the 55 millimeter rings. So they're very small, especially for me, I've got big hands and as a nurse like to tell me I've got fat fingers. So it's a really fiddly little surgery for me in a dog this size, but um, if you can get the implants on there and, and um, have them function, and I think it works really, really well. So this next case is a dog that we saw probably three weeks ago now. Um, I was going to put up a series. I've had um, a bunch of hip replacements in the last couple of weeks, but um, I thought I'd just go through one of those with you. So this was about three weeks ago we operated this case, and it's a 10-month-old 50-kilo mixed-breed dog. Um, and I'm not sure if I've got the left-right marker. So I've got the left-right marker on the x-ray there i'd like you guys to tell me what is going on with this dog and what we need to be thinking about so hip luxation from alan is it a hip luxation or is it a subluxation Yeah, subluxation, dysplasia, all correct. Anyone else see anything different? So the hips, they're kind of the obvious. The hips, the grab diagnosis on the left side. Um, there's definitely subluxation there. Anyone see any other changes associated with the hip that we need to think about? Yeah, so Nicola's jumped on that straight away. So this dog also has a medial patel luxation um, in that left hind leg as well. So you guys are all jumped onto that as well. So that's great. So this was a, um, an interesting dog, really nice dog. He's my kind of dog. He's about 50 kilos. He's a scruffy looking mixed breed. Um, so definitely um, my kind of um, animal. And he presented and he had a um, intermittent, very intermittent left back leg lameness. Um, he had a muscle atrophy in that left thigh. We can see that on the radiographs here. Um, and you could actually feel this hip popping in and out. Um, subluxating in and out when you rock this dog's hips from side to side. And you could also um, feel that the patella was luxating in and out and that um, was giving him some discomfort as well. Um, Alan has just put in a comment here, could the MPL be due to the subluxation? And, and I think that's a great comment. And we're going to come back to that in a little bit, Alan, but it definitely could be a contributing factor. And I put this case in here because we've got our patelluxation module on the Vet Dojo um, website. And um, this is a case where it is a really challenging situation to know what the right thing to do with this particular case is. So we'll just bear in mind for now that he's got a hip luxation, uh, sorry, hip subluxation, and he's got the medial patelluxation. He also incidentally has some degenerative changes associated with the acetabulum and the femoral neck, a little bit of arthritis developing on that right hip as well. So this case, you know, he would not be a candidate for a, a double pelvic osteotomy or triple pelvic osteotomy. Um, if for one thing, he's going to have far too much subluxation. 
Um, and I don't think we need to do a distraction view to determine that, but also started to get some degeneration there. So he's 10 months old. We can't do a DPO or TPO. So we're needing to think about what options we've got. But before we get there, <clears throat> I just want to show you some videos of this dog walking around. So this is the patient. Um, this is him walking around with his patella in place. So you can see he's got quite a good hip sway. Um, he's a bit ginger on that left side. I'll play it through again. Um, but he's not too bad otherwise. When we look at him, and I actually luxated his patella, you can see how um, uncomfortable he is with that patella in a luxated position. But you could literally flip this patella out and he would look, walk like this video on the right. Whoops. Um, and you could pop that patella back in um, and he would walk almost you know, normally other than the hip sway um, as in that video on the left-hand side. So when I was chatting to the owner, um, she was quite concerned about um, the patella and this dog um, was really referred down to us with a history of the patella luxation um, and the hip was thought to be an afterthought and when I looked at this patient um, and when you luxate the patella we can see that there's quite a big difference in his, his gait but his stifle actually was quite comfortable through a range of motion even with the patella out his stifle was quite comfortable this dog did not tolerate at all any kind of manipulation around his hip. So any kind of um, extension of the hip, any abduction of the hip, this dog was really, really, really painful. And so um, I think it's an interesting one because while the patella is there and, and that's a, an obvious problem, the hip um, to me was the most clinically important aspect of this case from the first instance. And that was the discussion I had with the owner and that's what we recommend fixing. So the fix that we did for the hip um, was basically to do a total hip replacement. Um, and I am gonna come back to a couple of slides about how the hip luxation, subluxation relates to the patella luxation. But um, with the hip replacement, just have a bit of a chat about that. Now this is a 10 month old dog. We're using the biometrics uh, hip replacement system here, which is um, a stem which allows for boning growth in this proximal section where the cancellous bone is. And this is actually a lateral bolt stem. So we've got a, a bolt that we um, insert across here that actually screws up into the, the stem, into the neck. Um, and that does a couple of great things for this neck. It provides some stability and, and reduces the risk of subsidence, which is where this, um, this um, stem can actually move down. Um, the central section of the, of the femur here before there's bone in growth. And it's really, really useful in these young dogs where the bone is a little bit softer um, to have that lateral bone in place and, and give that extra resistance to the subsidence. Um, and so I have a lot of faith in this um, implant system, especially in dogs of this age. Um, and I think we can avoid the need for doing a cemented hip in these particular cases with the addition of this lateral bolt. So, um, the hip replacement, you know, I think it's a very reliable procedure. I have no hesitation if the dog's very painful um, in the hip joint recommending that um, as the procedure and that's going to give us absolutely the best outcome in terms of function compared to something like a, a femoral head and neck excision. Um, Alan, incidentally, has just put a question in here about can we do a toggle pin to fix that degree of subluxation? And the answer to that is generally no, it's not going to work very well. And the problem is that if we tried to do a toggle pin, if I go back... Um, Go back a slide. If we tried to do a toggle pin, so we get this hip reduced and we put a toggle across here, um, we've still got a very lax joint capsule. We've still got a very abnormal dorsal acetabular rim. And so all the primary and secondary stabilizers for the hip joint that we would rely on ultimately are not very good. They're not in very good shape. And so if we were to do a toggle pin, we're still relying on that um, toggle material pretty much for the life of that hip um, to stay intact. And it doesn't matter what you put down there, um, ultimately that would fail and we'd end up with the same situation where these hips were hip would subluxate again. So in a dog with arthritis um, and a lot of changes in the acid table and in the femoral head, um, a toggle pin is generally not the best option for treatment of um, the hip luxation. So the slides I wanted to show you are these ones here and this kind of talks about how we have this interrelation um, between the patella luxation and the hip. And what I've um, tried to mark out here, the green line represents the long axis, um, the anatomic axis of the femur. And this red line is indicating um, the femoral neck. And what I want you to, I guess, pay attention to is what is the length of the femoral neck and then what is the angle? So what is the angle that we have in here um, between the long axis um, and the femoral neck? And what we're looking for is really this, um, Coxa valva or Coxa vara. 
And what I want you to think about is that when we do a procedure for hip dysplasia or hip arthritis, whether it's a femoral head and neck excision or whether we're doing a total hip replacement, we're changing the conformation of that hip and that changing conformation of the hip and biomechanics of the hip will have an impact on the patella. And so if this hip was in a normal position, so firstly addressing that question about subluxation. So this hip is subluxed to that, subluxated out. We can see it's sitting well away from the dorsal acetabular rim here. If that femoral head was sitting over here, then we would have a situation where the pull of the rectus femoris, which is, rect which is um, indicated by this blue line, the pull of that rectus femoris would be more in line with the long axis of the femur. And so there'd be less tendency for that poor rectus femoris to actually pull that patella into a medial location. So the fact that this hip has now subluxated, so it's gone from over here to over here, we now have an angle down here, which has created a medial vector on the patella um, when there's pull on the quadriceps. And so when the hip subluxates, that can make um, the patella luxation worse or make it a greater likelihood of that occurring. When we look at this situation on the right, where we've actually done a hip replacement, this can also change the angle on the pull on the patella. And so when I put the femoral, sorry, when I put the hip replacement implants in there, it's interesting that the angle um, of um, inclination of the femoral neck is actually similar on this image on the right compared to the left. But we can see that the relative length of that neck is much, much longer. And so that relatively long neck does start to shift laterally the femur and does start to increase this angle um, that's made with the rectus femoris. And so what I'm trying to get at in a nutshell is that when we put a hip replacement in there, the extra length of that femoral neck and sometimes the change in angulation um, of inclination can actually pull um, that patella and actually force that patella to luxate into a more medial position. And so in this particular case where the patella was already luxating, and this is a challenging situation because when I had a conversation with the owners at the start, we had to talk about the fact that, well, I think we need to fix the hip, but in fixing the hip, we are probably going to make the patella luxation worse. And that's going to mean that we're probably going to have to come back and look at another surgery in the future um, to actually correct that patella luxation. And so the owner was aware of that and, and thought that that might be the case. But I guess the question about, you know, do you fix the hip first or do you fix the patella first? In my opinion, with this situation, you know, this dog was painful in the hip. So that was one reason to fix the hip first. But also the second reason to treat the hip first is that we then determine the final location of that femur. And so then if we need to come and plan for a patella repair, we can always come back and plan that repair and, and move that tibial crest over as far as we need to. Versus if we started off over here and did the patella first, and then we came and actually did the hip replacement where we could actually change the biomechanics and then make the patella luxation more of an issue for that patient. So in most of these situations, I'm going to look at treating the hip first because it's, if it's the most painful thing and it also is going to allow us to step then and determine the, the um, biomechanics of the hip joint before we actually look at doing the patella luxation. So fair bit to think about with that case and it's an interesting one, but I think a good one to kind of talk through and, and chat about the different options. So another question from Mitzi, which is if you have a patella luxation to a femoral head excision, do you need to fix the patella or wait? So that's a great question. And again, it's a challenge with a femoral head neck excision um, and a dog with patella luxation, because when you do the femoral head neck excision, it's fairly unpredictable where that, um, where that femur is gonna end up. And I've treated them both ways. So sometimes I do the femoral head neck excision first. In other cases, I treat the patella first. I think you have to assess in terms of the decision-making about which joint you treat, which is the most painful, and which is the most challenging for that particular patient. Um, and so if the knee was the most painful thing, then I would think about doing the knee, but I would always have in the back of my mind that the change once we actually address the hip could create more of a problem um, with the patella. So a question there from Josh Rich. Um, did you measure the tibial slope to get an idea if it will go on to develop an ACL? Um, I didn't, but um, again, it's a large breed dog, so that's always going to be a possibility. So these are great questions, guys. So another question from Alan, doesn't mean a hip replacement surgery might create a medial patella luxation in a dog with a normal patella? That is a good question, and I guess it's possible. I don't know that I've seen that, um, but it definitely can create a situation, theoretically, where that's a, a potential problem. We're normally not changing things hugely. So in a normal dog where they don't have a tendency for luxation, it's a, a generally a pretty low risk, but I don't think I've seen that firsthand myself, but it certainly could be something that would be a potential problem. 
So great questions, guys. Um, and I'll give you guys a couple more moments just to fire away any more questions that you have about that particular case, and then we'll move through into some tips and tricks. And incidentally, is anyone there? Uh, maybe just give me a thumbs up in the comments. Um, has anyone done the um, medial patelloxation course on Vet Dojo? So no one, I don't think, has done that. So um, if you're interested, there's a lot of detail on there. Um, the medial patelloxation course that I've put together for Vet Dojo runs through um, basically everything start to finish assessment, treatment, um, and how to perform procedures like a tibial crest transposition, wedge trochlearplasty, and it looks at some of these factors that contribute to um, middle patelloxation. It does touch on a little bit of the issues that we see with distal femoral varus, but we don't go into in that particular course um, all the specific detail about how to treat that because um, that does become much more of a complicated um, process. So. Alan has got a question there, what's your post-op pain management? So for hip replacement, post-operatively, these guys, um, for me, they have a fentanyl patch on. Um, they have methadone overnight while they're in hospital for the first night um, until the patch kicks in. And then they generally go home with anti-inflammatories and um, potentially codeine in addition to the patch if they need to. Um, I do like to keep these guys nice and quiet um, for the first um, four weeks, especially while we're getting that bone in growth into the implants. So. Um, I do like to use trazodone in these patients if we if they're going to be a little bit boisterous or hard to handle. Um, but generally, these guys are, are markedly improved even within the first couple of days of surgery. They're quite comfortable. And even it, it does amaze me that we put all these implants in there and they're actually up and off and weight bearing on the leg the next day. So, Volverine, was the hip replacement tailored, apparatus tailored for this patient with a common standard sizes? So, this was all just standard sizes. Um, it is possible to get custom implants for different situations, but um, there's not a lot of situations where we need to use those. More often than not, we can get away with just the um, off-the-shelf products. Um, Josh Rich, what time delay do we expect for onset of the fentanyl patch? We actually assess pain scores in hospital, um, but generally somewhere between 12 to 24 hours is, is what we talk about for onset of the fentanyl patch. And to be honest, I'm probably using less and less fentanyl patches these days um, and reaching for things like opioids while they're in hospital, um, codeine when they go home. Um, and so, and, and a lot of intraoperative analgesia. So these guys will have an epidural um, also. Okay. So move on to the next case. Um, and these are just um, some slides I've put together, just looking at um, some general surgery tips and tricks. And um, I put this first slide in here. I'm actually editing on that one's not that great, but um, this comment behind the picture just says having the right tools makes the job easier. And so, um, you know, the tendency with surgeons, I think we're kind of like fishermen, um, and we see shiny things, we like to buy them. And so um, there's lots of different things out there, um, lots of different instruments. Um, I'm guilty, every time I go to a conference, I see something that's like, oh, that looks nice. Um, and, you know, I think that there's, while well, there's a lot of different things out there, having some fairly basic um, instruments will get you through a lot of different circumstances. And honestly, if you're in general practice, you don't have to spend the earth um, to have um, instruments that will really, really make your life a lot better. So as we go through, we're going to talk about a few different things here. Um, first thing is retractures. Um, you know, there's a saying, if you can't see, you can't do. Um, so I think having um, some really nice retractors helps a huge amount, and especially when we're doing like abdominal surgery. If you're working by yourself, even if you're working with an assistant, um, if you don't have Balfour retractors or some way of actually opening up the linear and, and being able to see what's going on in there, um, then it's going to be a much, much more difficult prospect, especially if we're trying to treat something um, where we need to be quite, um, you know, detailed and specific and we need to find, you know, it's a leak in the, in the intestine or something like that. We've got a septic peritonitis. We need to flush the abdomen out and make sure that we really flushed everything effectively. Um, my comment on Balfours is that if you're going to buy these, I like to get the Balfours that have the two um, bars along here. Um, and the reason for that is that when we try and um, open these Balfours up, if we have the units that just have a single... Um, connecting bar, I find that those tend to kind of shrink together um, with time, whereas if they have the ones with the two bars, they have less tendency to kind of creep back together on their own. Um, 
I always like to use them with a spoon. Um, the spoon is really useful to try and um, pull up on the, um, the xiphoid and, and keep the, um, whatever's left of the falciform fat out of the way. Um, and the other thing that we can do, and you can actually see that I've done it just here, um, is I've taken a towel clamp and actually that towel clamp's just in the, in the drapes. But what we can do is sometimes these um, balfours will have a tendency to slip around and I'll just try and, oops, highlight what I mean by that. Sorry, guys. Come back a slide. So these guys can tend to slip around. So sometimes we'll find that this end will end up, change the color of that. This end will end up going this way and this end will end up going this way um, and they'll rotate in there. And so you can actually put a, like a back house towel plan through the um, abdominal wall and just through one arm of that. Balfour and that'll actually stop those things moving around too much if you're having a hard time. The other thing that can help that is actually pulling up on the um, spoon here and tightening up our clamp for the spoon that'll help um, keep those in place. So a couple of things that can help you. So the next um, retractor is probably the most versatile and one that we have a whole bunch of different sizes. Um, and I've got um, five different sizes. I was lucky we've just set up this new hospital um, recently and I was getting to go through all the instrument catalogs and um, just pick a whole bunch of different things. So we use five different sizes of Gelpies. Um, they come in different kind of arm lengths and they've got different um, spike lengths here and, and whether these are sharp or blunt, I prefer the sharp ones with a fairly small um, kind of tip on them. Um, sometimes you can get them with different shaped arms, um, different configurations, but these are really, really useful. It doesn't matter if you're doing orthopedic surgery. Um, in this case, um, we've got a few different um, sets in there. When we're doing like hip replacements here, we're fixing a capital fysial fracture. But if you need um, to keep retraction when we've got a very small um, approach, then these guys can be really, really useful. And having a couple of sets can be really, really handy. In this situation, we're using it in the caudal aspect of the linear elbow. So we've got a balfour that would be set up in the cranial aspect and then I'm wanting to get access quarterly here so we can see the urinary tract. And this is really useful if we're going to take out um, sublumbar lymph nodes. And these are a really large set of gelpies. Um, you can see we've opened this um, linear incision all the way up to the pubis. This is a female dog, all the way up to the pubis. And when we're trying to get better exposure and, and be able to see better in this caudal part of the abdomen, then having a large set of gelpies in there can be really, really useful, as well as the Balfours. Um, towel clamps, um, again, I use towel clamps a lot for um, holding onto tissue and these backhouse towel clamps, it's a si simple instrument, um, but they're relatively atraumatic. So I'd rather use a backhouse towel clamp here and actually penetrate through the tissue and have a really solid handle that I don't have to keep replacing um, and grabbing onto things and, and traumatizing and crushing the tissue. We can just place it once through the tissue here and I've got a handle on the, on the, um, on the linear that we can use. Um, so having those towel clamps um, in there as a, a retractor can be really, really useful. So this is one indication, just using it on um, the linear alba where we're doing a gastropexy. Um, so Alan says, um, does the Balfour help when we're doing a gastropexy? We can see we're doing a gastropexy here. We can see my Balfour in here. Um, but we can see in a deep chested dog, it still can be hard to get um, that exposure and see where we need to see. So having an assistant or having a, a towel clamp on there that you can kind of literally lift up on the linear alba and then we can kind of see around the corner um, onto that um, peritoneal surface can be really, really useful. Um, and then over here again, this is where we're doing a cystopexy um, or tube cystotomy, I should say. So I've got a, um, a urinary um, catheter going, or sorry, Foley catheter going into the urinary bladder. Um, and then we've got a towel clamp here holding up the linear so we can actually do like a running purse string all the way around um, that hole that we've got into the urinary bladder to try and make a nice watertight seal between the urinary bladder and the abdominal wall. So towel clamps, another big one, very basic instrument, um, but one that I use all the time for a retractor. Um, next thing is suction. Um, so again, when I see and, and go into general practice, one thing that um, often sits in the surgery, often gathering dust in the corner is the suction unit. Um, and that can be for a variety of reasons. Um, sometimes the nurses don't like to clean up the suction hosing. Sometimes um, there's just lack of familiarity with it. Um, but I really think that suction um, is just, if you're going to do surgery and you're really serious about doing more and more and, and doing more challenging cases, then these equipment is really, it's a no brainer. And, and I think with surgery, your experience doing surgery is related to often how well things go and how easy you find it. 
And so having nice equipment um, really, really helps your enjoyment of the procedure. There's nothing worse than trying to do a procedure and not having the right tools and really, really struggling with it. And it's not because you don't know how to do the procedure, you don't know how to do surgery, it's just because you don't have um, the, the right equipment for the job. And it can make sometimes the patient's outcome suffer and then that creates stress for you. Um, but it's something that, you know, having the right equipment absolutely makes the job a lot easier and enjoys your, it increases your enjoyment, reduces your stress levels, and it absolutely makes you want to do more surgery. So suction is one of those things. It's inexpensive. You can get disposable suction tips. You can get disposable suction hoses. So there's really not an excuse for like cleaning and, and turning them over and things like that. They're inexpensive. You can get them from all kinds of different suppliers. And so um, for me, suction is an absolute no-brainer. If you're going to treat a case like this, which is a septic peritonitis, I really don't think you can treat this um, successfully or adequately if you don't have suction. You know, if you're trying to get all of this um, inflamed, infected um, peritoneal fluid out of this abdomen using swabs, you're really not going to do an effective job. And as you know, if you're going to try and treat this, you're really wanting to be flushing, you know, multiple liters of saline through that abdomen. And there's no way that you're going to be able to get that fluid out of the abdomen effectively if you don't have um, a suction unit. With the suction units, um, there's a whole, kind, whole bunch of different units you can get. Um, what you're actually using at the table is a, a bunch of different suction tips. The ones that we generally use are going to be either the pool suction tip, which is this one here, um, and that has multiple holes. Um, it's got a central um, cannula down the centre, um, and this is really great in the abdomen because the multiple holes, we can drain that really, really rapidly. It doesn't get clogged up that easily with the omentum um, or mesentery, and so we can really effectively drain that abdomen, find the leak, we can flush things and, and get that done quite quickly. Um, the other suction tips, I think I've got some pictures of those here. Yeah, so I've got some pictures here. So I've got the Fraser tip up the top right. Um, the Fraser tip is one that we use for um, joint surgery often. The Fraser tip often will come with a stylet. Um, this is the non-disposable one, but we, we just use disposable um, of these these days. Um, the stylet's really, really useful because if you're, um, doing like, for instance, a spinal surgery, or if you're, you're suctioning up little bits of tissue, they can quite easily clog these Fraser tips and the stylet's very useful to try and unclog those. Um, they often have a valve here, a um, little hole that we can control the amount of suction that's applied to the tip using our thumb. Um, and so that's what that is there for. And then this tip here is the Yanker tip or Yanker. Um, and the Yanker tip is again, one that can control the amount of suction that's being delivered via a hole, um, the thumb hole here. And, and these often have a couple of little um, fenestrations, a couple of holes at the end um, where we can actually suck the, the fluid through. And these are useful for abdomens. I use them a lot if I'm doing a dissection of you know, adrenal mass or liver mass or trying to um, separate some tissue. And we can just have that sitting in the area that we're trying to separate and just generally sucking the, the fluid away from the, the, the field. Um, the other thing that I do occasionally is, um, you know, if we're in the abdomen working on something very delicate like a ureter, and I don't want to apply suction absolutely to the tissue. Um, you can put a swab over that piece of tissue, like over the ureter, the periureteral tissue, and then we can apply the suction to the swab and then it doesn't actually apply the pressure directly onto the, the delicate structures underneath. So it can still enable us to um, effectively get rid of some of that fluid that's in the, in the field there. So suction's a really important one. I think the other really important one is electrosurgery. Um, and again, um, I know a lot of people have these units and they sit in the operating room and they don't get a lot of use. But once you start using electrosurgery, you'll really wonder how you ever did surgery without it. Um, at the moment, I can see Josh Rich um, sitting in his office there. He's giving me a smile. And I'm not sure, Josh, are you an electrosurgery advocate now? So you're still on mute there, Josh. Uh, yes, um, I, I, would, I wouldn't do a dog castration. I wouldn't do a dog castration without my uh, electrosurgery unit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's one of those things, once you start using it, it's just an absolute no-brainer. Um, it's so much easier and it's so quick and efficient and, and there's very little risk if they're set up appropriately. Um, with the electrosurgery, we can use monopolar or bipolar forceps. Um, I really reserve the bipolar forceps for very um, delicate structures if I'm doing neurosurgery like a, a brain tumor or if I'm doing spinal surgery that's what I'm going to use the bipolar and the difference between the bipolar and the monopolar cautery is that the um, current is concentrated between the tips and that current concentration um, creates heat um, and so it's very delicate there's no current going through all of the tissue versus the monopolar we have the current um, that is concentrated at the tip but then it's dispersed through the whole patient and then received by the grounding plate 
And so um, the reason that we get the effects of the quarter unit is because of that concentration um, of the current at that um, tip of the electrode. And so I use the monopolar for most things um, and you can use it for cutting tissue, you can use it for cauterization, um, but um, I'm generally, I used to use it a lot for cutting and, and I've gone away from that a little bit now. I use the scalpel from cutting through the skin, especially when I'm doing reconstructive surgery. And I do that um, now because I kind of think of, you know, having a successful outcome across the board, you have to try and account for as many of these little 1% challenges that you can and, and using electrosurgery probably do cause a little bit more tissue damage than we would if we used a blade but um you know you can probably get away with it most of the time but you know i'm quite anally retentive and, and i and you know a bit of a stickler for detail so um using electrosurgery does create a bit more tissue trauma but if you're trying to combine that with a reconstructive surgery where we're already asking a lot of that um rotated flap to um, have viability then that can be a little thing that that contributes to the viability or not um, so Alan has put in a comment here about any comment on the name of refurbished or um, used electric quarter units. There's a whole bunch out there. Um, Bio Valley, um, oh, sorry, Valley Labs, um, a pretty big one out there. If I have a lot of refurbished, I think that the refurbished units are fine. Um, it's not really um, complex technology that makes up these electrosurgery units. And so you can get them um, secondhand from a lot of different places. Um, they're pretty much universal with um, the hand pieces that can go into them. Um, some of the challenges that people have are often related to the return faults, which relate to the, um, the pad that we have underneath the patient and a, a, an issue with that return lead coming back into the electrode, indicating that there's an issue um, with that plate or the connection. And so there's different ways of getting around that. We have gone, gone through a whole bunch of different um, ways to deal with that. I think Charles might have talked about this in one of his... Um, one of his Q&A sessions recently, but we, for a while, we're actually just taking the disposable um, adhesive plates and sticking them to the metal um, electrosurgery, sorry, the metal surgery table. And so then the whole thing becomes the grounding plate. And then we'd have a, a towel on the, on the um, table um, to keep the dog warm and it would actually wet a small section of the, of the towel um, to actually allow um, the contact with the, with the surgery table. So, we had heated tables at that point, so there wasn't such a big issue with patients cooling down, but there's, there's a whole bunch of ways that we can, we can get around that. But the, the newer return plates and, and the disposable pads, they're generally pretty reliable. Um, we don't normally attach them to the dog. We normally attach them to a um, metallic plate and then have that sitting underneath the dog, which is covered then by some lap sponges that are made wet to create the contact with the skin. That's the way we find most useful. Um, vessel sealing devices. So this is the Ligashore unit that we use. There's a whole bunch of these different units around there. Um, this is kind of just in there, you know, this might be something that you have in your practice or not. The cost is kind of coming down. One of the issues with these is um, how we can actually um, re-sterilise these hand pieces. They're designed into people for single use only. Um, and so there are some challenges trying to re-sterilise them. They can't go in conventional autoclaves. Um, we We've actually had a new hospital just purchased um, a new um, plasma steriliser, which um, is really great for these hand pieces. The plasma steriliser used to be like horrifically expensive, but they've come down a lot in price. And so for us, we go through a large amount of these things and we can turn over um, these kind of instruments, which are traditionally single use. We can turn over um, all of the arthroscopy and, and whatnot equipment in there. Um, we also have ethylene oxide, but the challenge of ethylene oxide is it takes a long time to process those um, instruments. So, the vessel sealing devices um, do make life really, really easy if you're doing a lot of surgery and they're designed to basically um, have one of the vessels go within the jaws. Um, we clamp across and then we apply some current. The device is quite intelligent and it measures the impedance through the tissues and actually adjusts the amount of current that it delivers to, to seal the vessel and then it actually tells you when the vessel is sealed and then you can cut through it. And you can you know, comfortably ligate vessels up to five, six millimetres with that. So they, they generally work pretty well. So we go from um, Ligashore to the humble right angle forcep. Um, and if um, I have one hand instrument that I really, really love, um, it's the right angle forcep. And again, we have generally a couple of different sizes and shapes, um, but these are really, really great for dissecting um, around blood vessels. They're really, really great for dissecting. In this case, we've got a persistent right aortic arch. Um, so we've got esophagus down here and, and we're just dissecting out under that um, persistent right aortic arch. And so, they're really, really useful um, 
really, really versatile, great for kind of inserting into the tissue, opening up and, and blunt dissection. Um, and then once, for instance, if you had a vessel that's passed over here, once you've got that um, right angle passed underneath, we can open up the jaws, we can place some suture in there and then pull that back around and then we can ligate that vessel um, without any problems whatsoever. So um, very basic instrument, but very, very useful, very, very versatile. We can also use them for placing chest tubes um, or placing tubes in the abdomen, um, tunneling along under the skin and then dropping them down into the abdomen. Um, so yeah, I think they work really, really, really nicely. Um, this other retractor we've got up here is a finichetto, um, and that's kind of like the, the balfour for the chest, I guess. If you're doing chest surgery, we need to split the ribs, um, or if we're going into the, you know, splitting the sternum, then we need to have a finichetto in there. Um, these work slightly differently to the balfours. Um, they have a, a ratchet system up here that we wind out, and that'll actually make the, the space um, between the ribs bigger. Um, the debakey thumb forcep then, again, another really, really handy everyday instrument. We have one of these in all of our general surgery packs. Um, and these are one of the thumb forceps that I use most commonly. It's a vascular forceps, so the pattern of this forcep in the teeth, it's designed that you can actually hold onto tissue without applying much pressure um, because of the pattern um, that we have um, in the tips here. And so um, here, what we're doing is just holding onto the averted mucosa. Um, for me, again, I'm a bit of a stickler to detail. I generally try to avoid even holding on this much to the intestine when I'm, I'm suturing it. Um, I'm holding onto it here with the forcep because I'm actually going to resect all of this tissue. Um, I generally prefer to actually use these um, by pushing them into the lumen or, for instance, and then letting the jaws open up and then kind of manipulating things that way, pushing it around rather than grabbing onto things. But these are quite a nice, delicate forcep. If you haven't seen these, um, definitely encourage you to have a look at them and, and have a play with them. Um, really, you know, very good day to day. Um, stay sutures, again, these are kind of like a towel clamp. Um, again, a very basic idea, but it's something that can be really, really useful. And, and honestly, the sky's the limit with how you use these and, and, and different ways that they can um, be implemented. Um, this was a case, just to get you oriented, was a, um, a dog with a gastric ulcer from chronic non-steroidal use, and we're just going to resect that. So uh, not only does the photo look really pretty with all of our stay sutures around here, but we can... Um, really control leakage and things like that from the intestine. So I use this a lot for urinary tract surgery, for gastrointestinal surgery, all kinds of things where you know, rather than grabbing onto tissue multiple times, again, you can put a suture through there and you can hold onto that. You've got a really solid handle and you can manipulate the tissue without having to grab onto it. Because I'd argue even grabbing onto it multiple times with something like a debakey, it's going to cause an amount of tissue trauma each time. And so the more of that we do, um, and then if you compromise some blood supply and you do a whole bunch of other things, all those holes in the Swiss cheese line up and then eventually we'll have a, a complication. So we can see that we've placed our stay sutures, we've um, then opened up our um, stomach and then we've got really nice control of um, the stomach wall edges and we're not going to have any leakage of contents. And then once we've resected that whole area, I can literally then lift all of the stay sutures up together and then we can have um, a nice easy incision to close. And I always find it's much easier with these um, incisions in the um, stomach or intestine or urinary bladder we have an irregular shape if you can actually have tension on either end um, of that incision it makes it a lot easier to place the sutures um, accurately and, and and have those go in nice um, and have a nice tight closure so another example of the state of sutures um, what we're doing here is actually passing a catheter up into the common bile duct <clears throat> And again, I've got my debakey forceps here. I'm not grabbing onto the edge of the intestine. I'm just using these forceps to push on the intestine rather than grabbing it. But you can see the side of the intestinal incision, our enterotomy, we've got um, a stay suture here and here. And I've got another stay suture that's actually doubled over to increase the um, or decrease the pressure that is put on any bit of tissue. Um, so it's literally just that um, suture has passed through twice and then held on to up here. And this suture here is being used to pull the duodenum quarterly into the abdomen so we can get better exposure. Um, we've got the fundus um, of the stomach going to be sitting up just around here. So the stay suture is really, really, really useful. Um, so we'll just check the time. It's getting to 5 to 12. So I might pull up stumps here. Um, I'm gonna, I've kind of got a running list of topics to chat to you guys about. So I've got a, a few more slides in this particular presentation. But over the next few weeks, we'll, we'll get through that stuff. Um, so I've got another appointment that's going to be here in a couple of minutes, but have you guys got any questions on what we've talked about there or any um, kind of ideas on topics you'd like me to try and cover over the next few weeks? 
um, certainly feel free to jot them down into the comments section. Um, really like to thank you guys for joining me here today. I know it's a busy time and a pretty crazy time for everyone. I think it's a yeah, real challenge for business owners, employees, pet owners. It's a, a real stressful time. And I know everyone's feeling the pinch across the world in Victoria at the moment. We've gone into some fairly significant um, stages of lockdown. Um, and so it is a, a pretty challenging time. So certainly just encourage everyone to be kind and, and be nice to each other. And if um, any of you guys are listening from Victoria, if you just want to talk to me about how things are going, if you're feeling isolated and, and you know, just worried about how things are, then and certainly just want to put that out there to give me a call and we can talk about things. I know it's um, pretty challenging. I'm, I'm fortunate to have a really great business partner and, and people that I can communicate with about um, the state of play at the moment. So yeah, if you're having troubles, just let me know. Um, so a couple of questions. Um, Mitzi saying she really enjoys the sessions. Great to see you here, Mitzi. Um, can we have a talk about surgical skin flaps? Alan, that is on my list. So um, yeah, watch this space. And then Josh has said, are there recordings available for these sessions? Yeah, we are recording these, Josh, for sure. And then they'll get put up on our YouTube channel. So just keep an eye on there. Um, it takes a day or two for us to get them up there by the time they get processed and everything like that. So just let us know. But thank you very much, guys, and look after yourselves, and we'll see you all shortly.